Okay, so welcome everybody to uh, October's meeting. Um, there was a piece in this week's edition of FE Week on page 30 actually, on media coverage of further education. And it was written by an education PR expert. And she defends her sector as shrinking and gives advice on packaging FE stories for publication. Now, this branch has campaigned against uh, the decline in media coverage of FE with um, the TES publicly ending coverage this summer. And we've drawn support from the Workers' Education Association. We've connected with the Cooperative College, the British Psychological Society, the North of Time Mayor, with Chiomora MP, Melissa Benn, one of our mm -hmm. vice presidents. And we've had the support of our general secretary and the Right to Learn campaign on that. Because there is so much more to this than just reducing the amount of FE coverage. This isn't something that's happened on its own. It's happened alongside an effective pay freeze, alongside funding cuts that have equated to 12% cuts in real terms over the last decade. Culls of experienced teachers in redundancy processes losing Erasmus. Cuts to trade union education, a focus on academised schools and universities, not looking at HE delivered through further education and the deliberate underfunding, the systematic and systemic downgrading of further education, which is staged and which is deliberate. Mm -hmm. And this brings me to today's theme of the FE white paper, which came out this year, the new T level, um, the technical qualification that's supposed to be on a par with A levels, and the recent announcement that the government wished to do away with BTEX altogether. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Liz Bromley. Um, you've worked in universities for most of your career, and two years ago you took up the role of Chief Executive at NCG, Newcastle College Group of Colleges, um, and three of those colleges are in the Northern Region, Newcastle College, Newcastle Sixth Form College, and of course Carlisle College. So, welcome Liz. Um, should we be concerned that this government's narrow understanding of skills for jobs will have the capacity to deliver a responsive and innovative future workforce? Hello Anya and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. I think we have every reason to be extremely concerned um, and I think that the comments with which you've opened this meeting today are so pertinent that uh, there's a lot of talk about levelling up, whatever that means, but actually uh, real political moves to make uh, parity of esteem evident between HE and FE, I think is still lacking. I think the white paper gives a great opportunity in writing to start addressing those issues. And um, if you'd like me to, I can go through uh, some of the key points of the white paper uh, with my observations on what that means for FE. But I think there's got to be a root and branch change in terms of how FE is viewed, regarded, administered, uh, funded um, and indeed respected uh, by the government and by uh, learners because so often uh, young people will be massively influenced by if you don't get a degree then you're not really in the first tier, you're not really in the top tier and so everybody rushes off to think that they have to go to their the, the university, whether it's a local or a distant university, as opposed to the conversation which I believe we should be having, which is degrees are fantastic, brilliant opportunity. Apprenticeships, apprenticeships are fantastic. They're a different opportunity. And indeed, everything in between enables us to promote through education, social mobility, which takes you, the learner, in the direction that you want to go and it might be upwards and it might be sideways and it might be staying still but at least being mobile because you've got a stimulating uh, respected respectable and properly rewarded career option so thinking you know if I, if I start off by saying that's my perception of the world as it is at the moment um, and then my very personal view that that higher education has benefited massively from um, the marketization which occurred some years ago, because it has given it the autonomy to do what it wants with its money, to promote itself in ways in which uh, it, the vice chancellors and senior teams wish to go. And that, that sort of liberation has not come the way of FE. And whilst I'm absolutely certain that uh, everybody in this room would decry the marketization of HE, um, actually it's freed 
uh, universities up to do what they want in ways that they want to do it. And that is a liberation that FE simply doesn't have. And when I look at the costs of the um, professional services who administer FE, not because we want to be a massive bureaucracy, but because the funding rules require it, because the ESFA requires it, because Ofsted requires it, we actually spend far more proportionately on keeping our house in order administratively than we do in fueling our student experience and our, the ability of our teachers to do more and better, to undertake CPD and to really contribute to being part of a vibrant learning organisation, which is part of a vibrant learning sector. So if I get off my soapbox for a minute <clears throat> and look at the white paper, um, big focus on place, which I think we in the north of the country really need to maximise. Um, the, the opportunity uh, for funding deals, uh, whether it's through trailblazers, or, um, or the strategic development funding that was out there, the skills and productivity opportunities that are, were arising. I think that the white paper does give uh, the opportunity for place-based funding solutions to make a difference to what we do. Now I say that and that sounds absolutely terrific, but then you look at what's happening in the Northeast and you despair because the Ben Houch and Gavin Williamson friendship has meant that the great funding bids that have gone in from Newcastle in particular have all been not, not successful. Uh, there were great bids with great ambitions, but they were unsuccessful because the wrong politician for our place or the right politician for a different place was friendly with the Secretary of State. And that is absolutely appalling. You know, if you're going to level up, then you should be doing it on a meritocracy when bids come in that demonstrate how funding would be able to uh, release um, educational opportunity, release the um, energy of employers to work with educational institutions to bring learners in to create that social mobility through education in ways that simply haven't been realised uh, because all of the money seems to have gone to Teesside. Um, however, the white paper does put employers at the heart of the system and at NCG we are working incredibly hard to understand where we sit in terms of our place. We believe absolutely wholeheartedly that at the, at the centre of a successful community you will have a successful college, it will be opening its doors to its community and it, to its learners and to its people to make a difference in place and so we want to make sure that we are working with our employers providing our learners with the skills that employers want in order that our learners can get jobs with our employers and stay in the place and contribute to economic recovery, but also that we're offering a curriculum that is interesting, that's stimulating and doesn't necessarily have to go into the workforce. It can go into additional education, higher education, other forms of work, maybe teaching even, goodness me, who ever thought of that as an occupation, but you know, real opportunities for our learners to think broadly about what the golden key of education unlocks for them. The white paper puts a lot of emphasis on the development of HTQs, the higher technical qualifications at levels four and five, so sub-degree level delivery. And that, I think, puts a real spotlight on the future of HE and FE working in partnership. I think it also puts a real spotlight on the um, real value that HE delivered through FE can offer. I don't see our HE provision at NCG, and at NCG we have degree awarding powers, so we have a university centre in Newcastle. I don't see that as a direct competition with our local universities. I see it as an alternative route to higher education because the FE and HE student experience, in my view, is substantially different. It's a far more protected environment. It's a smaller environment. It doesn't bring with it some of the challenges that possibly more disadvantaged students will face going to live away from home, incurring lots of student debt and being in a world where they are truly supposed to be independent learners and yet may just feel very unsupported. So I think that the HE and FE offer is a different kind of offer that appeals properly to those for whom traditional higher education simply might not be um, representing a successful outcome. But of course it does raise um, a massive question over how we're going to work together because universities have so much more buying power, pulling power, marketing power to offer 
uh, those those degrees, uh, the, sorry, those qualifications at levels which, in my view, should traditionally remain in further education and, and give us the opportunity uh, to be able to go into the higher levels of work, which would be a first step to levelling up the respect of further education being an alternative to higher education, different but deserving of the same degree of, of respect and indeed ambition for those who choose to take further education as their learning journey. The white paper talks about flexible learning, modular learning, and about giving careers advice that's linked to those modules of learning that can be undertaken. Now, I spent the first part of my career, many hundreds of years ago, uh, working for the Open University, which was predicated on modular learning, predicated on going at the, uh, the speed of the learner and building knowledge incrementally to uh, a qualification that might step off at certificate or diploma or indeed full degree level. So I wouldn't say it was massively forward facing, but I would say it probably is a good thing to consider. But, but obviously the, the question of funding, the question of accumulated credit transfer, and the question of how we work together collaboratively rather than competitively to make sure that our learners who do choose to accumulate modular learning come out of it with a really joined up educational journey, I think needs a lot more discussion than the white paper currently offers. The bit that obviously has made my eyes light up is talk within the white paper of funding reform. And as I said at the very um, start of, of, of my bit of this contribution, um, the cost of the administration and the bureaucracy and the complexity of running further education to be compliant, in my view, are completely disproportionate to, to the investment into our learning. Uh, we are supposed to be um, a learning organisation, not a back office function. And when you <laughs> my personal experience is that we try really hard to do things well and be compliant, but it's not just and if we don't manage that then oh dear that doesn't look too well on, to, on us it has a very real consequence of financial clawback from the funding agency so if we don't get the admin right we stand to lose all the money that next year we could budget for a pay rise for new courses for new facilities for something that would make a material difference to our learner outcomes but we have to pay it back if we've got the admin wrong and for me that is a phenomenal waste of time investment and resource and there is a whole industry running around um checking that we are doing everything right we're running around trying to do it right and then another industry uh making sure that there's clawback which essentially just further damages our ability to deliver really good education there's then a section in the white paper around excellent teaching and cpd well, I would have thought that as part of a learning organisation, CPD was absolutely endemic to what we do. Um, I think that teachers and educators should be teaching and learning themselves in order to be better educators in all that they do. So at NCG, we've invested in a leadership hub, irrespective of the white paper, because it is my very, very firm view that unless we keep learning ourselves, we will simply not be uh, good educators. So those are the key points uh, I think that the white paper is framed around. <clears throat> of course, there's a great deal of detail around um, other issues which could have a really material effect, like the very oblique statement that the Secretary of State will have greater powers of intervention when things aren't working. Now, what does that exactly mean? You know, does it really mean that the Secretary of State is going to come down and say, Liz Bromley, I don't like the way you're running NCG, so I'm going to take you out and I'm going to support who? A local politician in? Um, somebody who, who the Secretary of State has greater trust in? How is that judgment based? So I think that that power of intervention for the Secretary of State being boosted is one to watch and one to perhaps be a little nervous of. Uh, we have a new FE Commissioner. The new FE Commissioner has been told or, or, or is telling uh, that we're moving away from an intervention and critical model and into an enhancement and search for excellence model. So we will see how that works and how that fits with the powers of the Secretary of State. And of course, there are big question marks over the future of Ofsted, the future of the ESFA, and indeed for those who've got HE and FE, the future of QAA. So that whole quality compliance enhancement uh, framework is is all questionable um, in my view under this uh, white paper. Um, 
I think that one of the massive errors in the paper is the uh, notion that the Chambers of Commerce are the appropriate employer representative to get this right and to make sure that we are doing a good job as educators, uh, supplying the skills and the workforce of the future that employers need. Um, my experience is that Chambers of Commerce are really not hugely well informed or indeed massively well networked. And for them to be the nominated employer-led body seems to me to be crazy and just demonstrates how little Gavin Williamson understood the detail of how the education system in the UK really works. Um, I think he was rather bamboozled by the glory of the German system and has just thought that you can transfer it into the UK and Bob's your uncle, that's the job done. So I think we've got quite a long way to go, uh, particularly when the Chambers of Commerce are leading the bids for the trailblazer local areas that are mooted in the white paper. Um, and quite often there is a feeling that the pieces are not being joined up in a logistical and pragmatic way because it's great to bid for new funding as long as there are defined outcomes from that funding, from that investment, which will make a material difference to the educational journey or indeed to the impact that a college will have in a local area. Um, something which I'm sure you've all been made well aware of is the notion of the uh, local skills improvement plans. Um, I have no real issue with that. Uh, local skills improvement plans would clearly uh, create a link between what uh, local economies need and what uh, colleges of further education and universities can provide in filling that skills improvement plan. Um, what I think is less clear is how they're going to work in practice, who is going to be invited to the table, and much more importantly, how are they going to be able to be judged? So let's say that the local skills improvement plan in Newcastle uh, sets out a very, very clear um, route map for the priority workforce areas, maybe energy, maybe modern methods of construction, maybe digital. But the colleges do what they think is right, the universities do what they think is right, but somehow what the LSIPs expected and what the uh, education providers provided don't match up. Who is going to be the arbiter? What are the consequences of that gap not having been filled? Or indeed, if we do it brilliantly, if we all work together exactly the way the white paper anticipates and do it really well, how is the incentive going to be uh, delivered to make sure that not only we continue to do it really well, but we act as a model for good practice for other places to watch and learn? So the devil is always in the detail, but I think that there are some real big gaps in the detail here that we need to be very, very cautious about. And we need to watch very carefully to make sure that we are not hoist by an undetected petard that we simply had not thought about when we were engaged very willingly in designing the LSIPs and thinking about accountability. Um, one of the things that is uh, very, very important to me um, in, in NCG is the uh, suggestion that colleges will be able to provide college business centres that will be a hub for employers, for students, and for um, colleges and deliverers of education to be able to come together in a space to make sure that the appropriate conversations are happening and the right plans are being laid. Again, who knows how the funding is going to be allocated? Who knows who is going to be successful in relation to those college business centres representing the region? So again, in NCG, we have seized the moment and we will be uh, launching our Synergy Hub. It's a really bad name, but it's what people wanted. So it's a Synergy Hub. It's on our Newcastle campus. Um, it's a place where we will have an entrepreneur in residence. Ho, ho, how grand that sounds. Um, but we will also have micro businesses and SMEs uh, working in there. Um, and they, they have a low rent that they pay to the college. But the much more important contribution that they make is that they devote hours per month to, uh, and to working with our students, to engaging our students, so that they get really practical, hands-on experience and understanding of either how to get a job in a micro, in a, in a, an SME, or how to establish their own uh, micro uh, company and be successful in that. So good ideas in the white paper that I'm not 100% confident we will navigate our way through for funding. So we will just get on and do them anyway. And, you know, with good luck and fair wind, we'll be able to apply for funding uh, later on. One of the things that COVID has absolutely put a spotlight on is the regional divide created by digital poverty. And I think that it is absolutely incumbent upon all of us who are in education to work together 
to identify where that third vulnerability of digital vulnerability uh, impacts on our learners and we do what we can to level that injustice up, whether that means opening our facilities up so that people can access the hard hardware and the software and the bandwidth and the physical space to be able to engage digitally in ways that looking at this screen I'm hoping all of us are doing from the comfort of our own homes in rooms where we're not being bombarded by other stuff uh, with sufficient bandwidth to both speak and listen to each other. Uh, we know that that is not a world that all of our students or indeed all of our staff inhabit and so it is incumbent upon colleges at the heart of their community to make sure that we do whatever we can to reduce that di digital divide and to ensure that we create those spaces where di digital impoverishment can be wiped away, if not permanently, at least for a reasonable space of time to allow, allow learners to engage. So that is a counter through, and I certainly don't want to dominate the conversation. I think that the white paper puts some very interesting ideas out there. Um, I really, really do not like the idea of VTEX being taken away through this um, review of HTQs. I think that BTEX provide an absolutely critical platform for young people who don't, for whatever reason, have the academic skills or desire to go into more academic, more specific uh, pathways of education. So I am continuing to lobby very hard that BTEX are retained. T-levels, I think, are an interesting uh, option. They're supposed to be the equivalent of an A-level. I got three A-levels in my lifetime. I don't think I can get three T-levels. Um, or indeed one T level, because the technical um, expectations of that component of the T level, in my view, are significantly more challenging uh, than, than other vocational qualifications. And I think that actually we're just putting an additional challenge into the system, both for the delivery of and for the assessment of our learners with the introduction of T levels as a viable option. So I don't think they are equivalent to A levels. I think in some ways they are harder and I do not see them as part of levelling the playing field. Uh, so in summary, uh, yay for BTEX, boo for T levels, yay for skills, question mark over the white paper, put colleges at the heart of the community, give them autonomy to sort their funding out, give them more funding so that they can really be levelled up to the university offer and give our young and indeed our old people the opportunity to have real choice through education and make the futures that they would like for themselves. Wow, thank you, Liz. That raises lots of questions and there's lots that is questionable there too. So. You are a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and you become a fellow when you've made demonstrable contribution to your community and in upholding certain values of integrity, equality, inclusion and the aims of the RSA as well, notably promoting innovation, creativity and doing that in line with those values and for social good. And this is the very antithesis of the government's post-16 agenda. So there's a dissonance here. So Liz, very quickly, just before um, we move on to our next speaker, I think I've got to ask you, how do you align your values with your decision making? And how do you get local community buy-in from communities that have been let down before? Well, I would like to say that base all of my decisions um, on those principles. I think that any learning organisation from the Open University right the way through my career to now NCG uh, creates a learning environment and indeed a, a workplace environment where many different diverse views and people can coexist and co-work at one time. I try absolutely to be ethical and fair in my decision making because for me fairness is probably the most important thing in our society that is so very often overlooked and I try very hard to take a human approach uh, to the decisions that I take so when I have to take a difficult decision I try to think how would I feel if this was impacting on me how would I feel if this was impacting on my child how would I feel if this was impacting on my mother for example, and by playing it through realistically in my own head, I try very, very hard to knock the rough edges off what we have to do when you're in senior management, which is occasionally make very difficult decisions, which do impact negatively on people. And to remember that the, you know, that, that the rules by which we ought to play are fairness and respect for our other humans. Um, having said that, you know, education is such an opportunity 
for anybody with any degree of innovation or ambition to be able to use that space really creatively. And I do hope that in all of my hundreds of years of working in education, wherever somebody has shown a spark of imagination, innovation, being different, thinking differently, I've given them the space and as often as I can the resource to take that opportunity and grow it. Thank you. I would like to welcome and introduce our second speaker today, Darren Northcott. You're a National Education Officer with NASUWT Teaching Union. Now, Darren, your union was one of 21 um, trade unions and campaign organisations that came together and put together a campaign called Protect Student Choice. And that's about reversing the decision to scrap BTEX. So welcome, Darren. Please, can you tell us more about this? And can you tell us what the unions need to do and why? Thanks very much, Anya. And good afternoon, um, everyone. As Anya says, I'm, I'm Darren Northcott. I'm the National Official for Education at the NSWT Teaching Union. And I want to talk a bit about skills from the perspective of our members um, but also qualifications policy more widely, because I think that's an issue of particular interest and concern to our members at the moment. Um, one of the interesting things about my brief is that we as a union organise, yes, in England, but also in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, and Gibraltar. I think I've got everything uh, I need to say on that list in terms of the scope of the union's reach. And it's very interesting. That's my brief of each of those jurisdictions. And that provides me and my colleagues with a very interesting uh, opportunity uh, to undertake an exercise in compare and contrast. So we've got different jurisdictions in the UK, all grappling with the same problems, all trying to exploit the same opportunities, going about that in very different ways and one thing doing this job I think makes you immune to is imagining that what's happening in other parts of the UK outside of England represents some kind of nirvana and they've got the magic solution and all we have to do is borrow what they do and all our problems will disappear that simply uh, isn't the case each of those jurisdictions has quite profound and deep problems but I'll confine my remarks just this afternoon obviously to the position in England the issues in I'll also say uh, right at the outset from our point of view as a union, we represent members and are recognised nationally in schools and sixth form colleges. So we're not recognised in the FE sector. We do have members who work in the FE sector, but our main focus is schools and sixth form colleges. But obviously, because the interconnections between the different parts of the education system, which I'll come on to in a moment, we have a very live interest in what happens elsewhere in the education system. But our members' lived experience, if you like, is, uh, is uh, secured in schools and in colleges. Um, so that's kind of where we start from, and that's our, uh, that's our perspective. Um, and obviously, in the settings where the majority of our members work in England, general qualifications predominate. So the kind of day in, day out life of our members in schools, in secondary schools, in school sixth forms, in sixth form colleges, in other settings, with 16 to 18 learners is pretty much dominated by general qualifications but what we call vocational qualifications and we can come on to that distinction um, in a moment do have a really important role to play in the suite of, of learning offers that our uh, that our um, settings in which our members make available to their members so vq is an important part of what our members do but they're also an important part of that broader qualifications um, system and so issues like apprenticeships, for example, obviously we have very few members who are engaged directly in delivering apprenticeships. I think most experience in schools and sixth form colleges is about the apprenticeships that are offered to staff working in those settings. So we have a teaching assistant apprenticeship that's been rolled out. We've got a teaching apprenticeship that's also part of the now very wide range of routes uh, to securing a qualified teacher status. And general qualifications, I think, are the bread and butter, if you like, of settings in which our, uh, which our members work. But the general direction of, of skills policy, and if you like, qualifications policy, um, is really concerning. And I want to focus particularly on qualifications and some of the issues that our members raise about the qualification system and some of its um, implications. And just to go back to your point, Anya, about the removal of BTEX, 
I think clearly that is a short-sighted decision for some of the reasons that Liz touched on as well. It's a retrograde step. BTEX play an important role in the suite of qualifications available to, to learners, and their removal is largely driven by, I think you could say, ideological considerations rather than considerations that really put the needs of the learner at heart. And so we would, and we, as you say, we're part of campaigns to try and get that decision reversed. We'll continue to do what we can um, to get a reversal of the government's position on that. Um, so they're valuable, but I think we have to be clear that they are helpful, certainly, but within a qualification system itself that is fundamentally flawed. If we were going to start from scratch and invent a qualification system across the 14 to 19 sector, we would certainly not define what we have now currently. There are lots of flaws and shortcomings in that, um, in that system. So restoring BTEX is important in the current context, but I think we need to try and look more broadly and more radically about how we structure the qualification system in England. And that's been a concern, certainly, of my um, union for quite some time. But I think the issues around qualifications have been thrown into pretty sharp relief by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think it's shown some of the fragility and lack of resilience that we see in our qualifications um, system. And from the point of view of the SEA, obviously, you will be thinking about the next general election. Who knows when that is going to come? And the Labour Party has an opportunity to think about its approach to qualifications. So we pretty much know where the government has set out its stall. Where does the Labour Party want to set its agenda? What's its agenda for qualifications going to look like? And there's an opportunity here for opposition parties to think very carefully about what alternative vision for qualifications can they advocate to the, um, to the electorate going into that next election. So I'm just going to make some comments that maybe you could view as a hypothesis, as a starting point for thinking about that, those really important points that might inform the thinking that goes on into the run-up to the next election. And I just want to be really clear that what we really can't talk about is taking solutions from the past and trying to cut and paste them into the education system in 2021. That never works. You can't just take uh, those policy solutions lock, stock and barrel, and try and apply them to the situation as you find it. But, that's contradict myself maybe, but if we go back to where we had got to as an education system in terms of qualifications reform by May 2010, and I hope no one here needs me to prompt them as to why May 2010 is a significant date in that respect. Where we've got to by May 2010, I think is quite instructive um, because I think the changes that we were seeing up to that point and the changes we would have seen after that point had that election turned out differently would mean that we would all be sitting here now looking at a very different qualification system to the one that we will deal with currently. Because we were in the middle, by that point, of a very radical change in our qualifications system, which would have had profound and far-reaching consequences. And just to cast our minds back to that period, those changes were being driven by the last Labour government's 14 to 19 strategy. A 14 to 19 strategy. You go back to the 2000s. 14 to 19 was the way in which we described that sector. It's a term very rarely here now, but it was a significant term in terms of how it described that policy. And that approach, insofar as it had got to where it had got to, was based around something that we as a union supported very strongly, which was a system of what were called 14 to 19 diplomas. They live on still in the extended award qualification that we see among the general qualifications on offer currently, but they've pretty much um, departed the stage. And those reforms, that 14 to 19 agenda taken forward by the last Labour government, 
grew out of a document that is well worth revisiting if you're interested in these issues. And that was the review conducted by Mike Tomlinson back in the early part of the 2000s, which looked fundamentally on an evidence-based, during it through an evidence-based process that took a lot of views from stakeholders across the system about what we want our qualification system um, to achieve. And there's a debate, there was a debate, there still is a debate about the extent to which what the last Labour government did really reflected the agenda that Tomlinson set out. We, we don't have the time to explore that debate in too much detail this afternoon, but be, be all that as it may, we had a very clear agenda that was, uh, in my union's view, very rudely interrupted in um, May 2010. And there were a number of things, bearing in mind you can't take those solutions precisely and apply them to the system that the next Labour government perhaps will inherit when it takes office. But there are some really important principles that I think need to be put on the table when we're thinking about what we want the future of the qualifications framework to look like. So I'll just run through a few. There are more, but I think these are really important points to bear in mind. So as I said, at the core of the reform was a 14 to 19 diploma, and this is forgotten now. But had Labour won the general election in, in March 20, in May 2010, by 2013, there would have been no GCSEs. So the core award was a diploma, and that diploma would have been awarded for so-called academic and so-called vocational learning. It was a common award that would have been made to learners across the 14 to 19 sector. And learning under that diploma, core principle that was at the heart of those reforms was that we weren't going to have sharp divisions between what we call academic and what we call vocational learning, that learners' experiences would have been a blend of both of those. And actually that would have challenged some of the false distinctions we see between what's called academic and what's called vocational learning. As Mike Tomlinson used to say, a, a de law degree from Oxford University is pretty much a vocational qualification, whichever way you look, but I think a lot of people wouldn't have described it as such. So it was under really, I think, looking carefully at those distinctions, it would have been a common approach to accrediting learning. Really important. GCSEs would have been abolished under the plan by 2013 to be replaced by a diploma. That's amazing when you think about it now. If you sit here in 2021 and think about that was a government's policy, that was an agenda that a political party went into a general election, and if it had won, that is what it would have done, is almost mind-blowing when you think about the qualification system that we see um, currently. And that approach, one of the things that drove it, was trying to develop a greater sense of parity, of esteem between different sorts of learning across the system. Really important, I think, principle. So that was key. Just again, another thing that I think, again, reflects some of the debates we've had over the past decade, but the approach adopted really looked at this in an interesting way, was that if we think about the modes of assessment and loads of the debate that we have about qualifications is about exams, the relative merits or dismerits of exams, and a lot of that, I would say this government's agenda around exams is very largely ideological. It's an attachment to examinations per se. And what the 14 to 19 agenda was very clear about was that what you needed was uh, an approach to assessment to adopt types of assessment that suited particular aspects of learning. So it had a practical, pragmatic approach to modes of assessment, wasn't part of an ideological struggle over whether examinations are, are meritorious or not. It also saw 14, this goes back to the point about 14 to 19, it conceptualized the 14 to 19 age range and the educational providers who support learners in that age range as a unified coherent sector in and of itself. So our system is based on, to a large extent, driven still by accountability measures for schools by a sharp, but now I would say redundant cutoff point at 16. So why are qualifications undertaken at 16? The 14 to 19 agenda, 
I think creates an opportunity to think about tailoring learning experiences to meet the needs of individual learners without this pressure for so many um, qualifications to be achieved by the time pupils reach the end of year 11. Really key. Another thing that again seems almost extraordinary now to think about, but it was at the heart of government policy, was the principle that no one school or no one college could deliver the whole range of a learner's entitlements by itself. So what was central to that strategy was the development of 14 to 19 partnerships and settings did not have a choice as to whether they wanted to be in a 14 to 19 partnership. Everyone had to be in that partnership. So collaboration between different providers of 14 to 19 education coming together to provide a collective learning offer to young people was again a core part of that, um, that strategy's approach. And that I think would have opened up, and we hoped it would have opened up, a lot of very interesting conversations about other issues as well. If you have, for example, a 14 to 19 partnership approach, what does that mean for a school and college accountability system based upon the performance of each individual setting? If they're all collectively responsible for providing learning offers and the quality of learning, then that would have opened up lots of interesting conversations about how our school and college accountability system works. And again, from the vantage point of 2021, that seems a strange land when we are still locked into single setting um, accountability. And one of the points I think that came up in discussions uh, around this and um, that I found particularly interesting was what would this mean for, let's say, grammar schools in those parts of the country where grammar schools still exist? So a lot of effort and energy goes into grammar school entry and securing grammar school entry. But if you're in a grammar school, if you're a learner in a grammar school, by the time you got to 14, so by the time you got to year 10, your grammar school would have been part of a 14 to 19 partnership. And while you might have been formally enrolled at that grammar school, a lot of your learning might have been provided by other settings within your partnership which again raises interesting questions about how grammar schools would have sat within that system and what that might have meant for the long-term future of the grammar school system. So there's a lot there and I could go on further, but I think my final hypothesis that I will pose to you is that, well, who knows why Labour lost the May 2010 election? Uh, I'm not particularly well qualified to comment on that. You might be in a better place to do so. And I know there are lots of theories and miles of print has been produced exploring that particular issue. But my contention would be Labour didn't lose that general election because of its 14 to 19 strategy. And I would also suggest to you that Labour won't lose the next election if it develops a qualification strategy that takes some of the principles that Labour was applying when it was last in office and thinks about how those can make sense in the education system of the 2020s and beyond. And I'll, I'll stop there, Anu. I went on longer than I planned to, I apologize for that, but hopefully that was of some interest to colleagues. Thank you, Darren. Now, Matt Waddup, who was UCU's Head of Campaigns and Policy and who was one of the founders of the Right to Learn campaign of, about lifelong learning, he has said that in FE we must not let employers off the hook. So what can the trade unions do to keep the pressure up on employers in terms of funding, in terms of pay, in terms of this post-16 agenda? I read, this was some time ago, but it was a really interesting academic article. And I've tried to find it again and I can't find it, but I'm gonna carry on looking. It was a historical study of the views of employers on the state education system. And it began with a series of quotes. It was kind of a game. And you have to say, when did you think this quote about the shortcomings of the education system was made by employers? And effectively, the message from the article was, and it was very compelling, was that employer critiques of the state education system have been around for as long as the state education system has been around. And I think we have to acknowledge that. One of the issues I think that staff working in the centre, uh, working in centres, working the education system, um, often is that whatever happens 
does it ever satisfy employers? I think that's really interesting. You can go back and look at some of the comments of Charles Clark on this issue uh, back in the 2000s when he was Secretary of State, and you can see some of his exasperation about that. So it's very difficult sometimes to understand what employers want from the state education system because they're extremely critical of it and their criticisms of it are, I'm afraid, a characteristic feature of the state education system since it was founded, let's say, in 1870. However, I think one of the challenges we face, and this goes back to something Liz said that I think was really important, is about who is the voice of the employer? Who is the authentic voice of employers? Because employers are important stakeholders in the system, and it's important that they have a proportionate degree of influence over what that education system looks like. I can't think of a worse representative group of employers than local chambers. I mean, so I would wholly endorse what Liz has said there. There are ways in which employers, I think their voice and their, their views can be secured authentically. But I think the first stage in addressing that very important challenge, Anya, is for us to be clear about who are employers anyway? Who is the authentic voice of employers? So we can hold them to account and we can say to those employers, you have a genuine opportunity to engage with the education system. You have a genuine opportunity to help shape reform. But once you've helped shape reform, you own it. And so the historical pattern of advocating for particular reforms getting reforms, and then some within the employer constituency criticizing the reforms that the same people advocated for, that game probably has to come to an end if we're really going to see genuine and meaningful employer engagement in the development of our education system. Thank you, Darren. And I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Julie Ward, you are the former European Parliament member for the North West. Welcome, Julie. Julie, you have a lifelong interest in the arts in taking the arts to communities of working with disadvantaged young people. Now, I know you're in agreement with me that losing Erasmus is devastating. It was so much more than a university exchange scheme. It was and it is still a huge programme that provided training and opportunities for professionals and for young people. But back to BTEX. BTECs are a recognisable qualification in Europe and T-levels are not. BTECs have been a route for uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds to universities and into careers. So young people are going to be stuck without opportunities to climb ladders or to travel and study in Europe. But if you are black, if you're poor, if you're disabled, if you're hungry, then the odds are stacking against you in education. We know this from our recent meetings with um, Julia from the British Psychological Society, Melissa Benn, the education writer and one of our VPs, Gordon Marsden, former shadow education minister, uh, children's charity, um, Children North. So with a post 16 agenda that is focused on reducing and diminishing post-16 education to skills, that it's all about training and it's not about teaching. It's about teaching people to do things and, and not to think. What are we in danger of? Are we in danger of becoming a two-tier society of the haves and have-nots? And what can be done about this, Julie, please? Uh, okay, thanks for asking me, Anya. Um, it was great that you name checked Gordon Marsden there because Gordon Marsden and I worked very, very close, very, very closely together when I was an MEP, not just because I was an MEP for the Northwest of England and he was represented one of my um, constituencies in the Northwest, but because he had um, responsibility in the shadow cabinet for um, uh, for post 16 um, and had a lifelong um, passion actually to make sure that young people could progress and achieve and uh, you know live out their dreams actually it's really important and I think it's that living out of one's dreams that is really under attack here. Um, I thought I would tell a, a few stories um, because um, before I became, so for those of you that don't know, I was first elected in 2014 and I was re-elected in 2019. I stayed right until the bitter end as an MEP. 
But before I was an MEP, I ran um, a social enterprise, um, an arts, um, uh, an artist cooperative based in a very deprived part of County Durham, uh, using the arts as a vehicle for social change. Joanna well knows the work that I did. Um, we worked with the most deprived communities and we worked closely with um, FE uh, providers um, and providers of informal education particularly. Uh, and I was also, my organisation was also the um, British partner for a peace school in Germany, which um, participated in um, youth in action programmes and youth in action programmes were one of the programmes that got subsumed into Erasmus, making it the plus on the end. Uh, but I was reflecting, when you asked me to speak today, I was reflecting on a very specific programme that I participated in, which um, was funded by Grundvig. So the Grundvig programme was the bit that allowed you as um, uh, educators, teachers, you know, people involved in um, education, whether it was formal or informal, to go and learn um, from other practitioners in other countries that were part of the Erasmus programme. And um, it's very important for people to recognise here that you don't have to be in the EU to be part of Erasmus. We could still be in it. Um, and this particular programme was, um, uh, it was a, a joint venture between a British music education organisation called Superact based in the southwest of England and the Netherlands Prison Service. And basically they were developing a qualification uh, called SEPA, which stood for Supporting Employment and Personal Effectiveness or Supporting Employability and Personal Effectiveness. And my engagement in that programme gave me a qualification to teach SEPA, which became a BTEC accredited course um, that the University of Exeter, uh, University of Exeter jumped through all the hoops that you have to jump through in order to get this um, as a recognized qualification. And, you know, so this was something that had been modeled and explored um, in the prison service with young, largely young men who were being failed by um, formal education, falling foul of all kinds of um, issues in their society, ending up, you know, um, in custody, but being given another chance. And what we looked at doing was how we could take that model and bring it back to our deprived communities in County Durham, um, lots of people with disabilities, lots of people um, with issues around employment, lots of people with mental health problems, um, uh, and use this as a, as a way to bring people back into education and training, maybe as a step to something else that they might do. So that, that very project is one example of what we are not able to do going forwards. And I wanted to link it to this discussion about VTech because it was incredibly niche and it is exactly the kind of program that the government will say is not necessary. But I didn't see anybody else offering that kind of targeted program that we as a social enterprise, small organization, and indeed an employer, and we, you know, as, a, as an arts organization, we were employing people, we still do. And, but we would not be able in the current circumstances to um, either train people to deliver that or to offer it to the communities that we were working with. And I find that really, really concerning uh, because it was, uh, it was in a hugely significant, important program. And it was being rolled out subsequent to the work that we did. It was being rolled out to other countries as well, such as Portugal. So here was a model of best practice, which was being picked up elsewhere. 
Um, the I witnessed during um, both prior to being an MEP, but also during my time as an MEP, the way that the Erasmus Plus program gave the most disenfranchised, the most marginalized people, um, extraordinary experiences that gave them dignity and pride. So, and I'm going to give some examples. I think it's really, really important. One of them was Headway Theatre, which is based in Northumberland, run by uh, an old friend of mine, Alison Walton Robson. Headway Theatre works with people with learning disabilities and does much more than theatre and really helps those people who would in many other circumstances be in those horrendous training centres where they would just be counting buttons, you know, for a few pennies a week, which is what used to happen, you know, have been given an incredible kind of sense of personal agency um, and confidence to participate in, um, in civic life. And that is largely due to Headway um, going hell for leather to engage in nearly every single Erasmus Plus call out that was ever going, which means that those people working with Headway Theatre, those people with learning disabilities, were the most well-travelled people that I ever met. Uh, every time I saw them, they were off to do another exchange project with yet another group of people, um, peers like themselves from countries all across Europe. And they grew in stature and confidence, um, uh, which impacted on their well-being, on their relationships with their families, with their peers, with their communities, you know, uh, gave them such a, such a sense of, of their own agency. And of course, all that is going to be taken away from them. Um, I also witnessed um, a school for autistic children participate in a um, uh, Am I still there? Did I go offline? I'm still there. I witnessed a school for autistic children um, in Stockport, actually, participate in an Erasmus Plus programme. So we all know autistic children really, really struggle to be social. They struggle with mainstream school. They struggle with, you know, at youth clubs. They, tr they, they struggle with that kind of social interaction. But what I witnessed was a... Uh, a group of um, students from this uh, group of students with autism from different um, institutions from different European countries coming together in Brussels um, uh, to share ideas, um, to try out different methods, to with the the um, with the teachers and the educators learning, with the students kind of, you know, sharing things. And, and I then went to the school in Stockport a couple of months later, and I was told that the students subsequent to this experience had come back, had managed to get um, work experience placements, had started off social, a social enterprise cafe in their own school, were running a debating society, right? All these things that you think is not possible for kids with autism. And, and these are concrete things. And it's very important to talk about this because it, is, because it is those kids having those amazing experiences where other people suddenly believe in them. And those are the things that are, bit, that are being taken away. Um, so I'm, uh, what I think is happening, because we have to ask, why are the government doing this? Why, why are they having this white paper? Why, why do they see the need to do this? And I think it's part of a long, long, um, a, a long strategy, uh, really to take away, um, to take away from people that sense of their own um, their own power, their own power and 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 the way that they might be able to be powerful together collectively. 
So, um, and we've seen loss of shore start, loss of the youth service, loss of the career service, you know, EMA was cut. We've got no Erasmus Plus anymore, you know, an assault on teachers and everybody working in the public sector, an assault on trade unions. We've just seen this continued um, attack on, um, on a sector that really uh, is a, should be about encouraging that, um, that sense of self, that sense of self and one's place in society. And it really concerns me because I think what it's about is about a sausage machine. It's about, okay, people as, you know, um, people as economic va monetary value uh, rather than uh, people as uh, vessels in of inquiry and curiosity, you know, who can bloom and blossom and grow um, if they're given opportunities to learn in lots of different ways. And it's that lots of different ways that really makes the difference. I I failed everything when I was at school, everything. And it was youth theatre that changed my life. So it was the opportunity to do something after school um, that changed my life. And later I went to university at the age of 52 and I had that opportunity. Um, but it is significant others who have been really important in my life. And that's not, you know, I had wonderful parents, but I fought against them for many years. And I think, you know, if we want to look at all the people who, who, who create that, uh, that web, that network, that safety net for young people when they are so vulnerable, when they are so confused about things, you know, about their gender, about their place in society, about their abilities, you know, about, about speaking up, about, you know, being angry and upset about things, but not knowing where to go. Actually, they are just losing more and more and more of the significant people that are around them. And I'm really concerned about that. And the, um, the, the way that education is now less about, you know, generating and encouraging a love of learning and more just about, you know, part of this sausage mas machine that we're going to put young people through. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, I think we have to be angry, actually. You know, I, I, I think, when am I going to stop being angry? I, I came into politics because I was angry and, I, and I'm still angry. And I think we have to be very angry on, on, behalf, of, on behalf of young people you know, whose life chances have been severely limited by um, the way that the government have taken away so many things. So the Erasmus Plus um, issue has been taken up by um, an alliance of people who are um, organised and fighting to um, find a way for us to rejoin. And I think young people have to be at the heart of that. They need the rest of us to support them and be with them on this journey. But we really need to get young people to see what it is that they have lost from uh, the mobility that was provided by Brexit, but also the specific opportunities that I've just outlined um, through the Erasmus Plus programme. If I can just say there are some other things that we are severely missing because of the hard Brexit that was totally unnecessary. We could have left the EU and still um, be part of many things that would have made a massive difference to our communities and also to the education, um, training and skills sector. So one of the things that we did in the Education uh, and Culture Committee in the European Parliament was to share common problems and solutions so that we're not reinventing the wheel and we've got economies of scale. And of course, we're not part of that anymore. We're not part of all those fantastic com conversations and conferences and events and pilot projects and schemes and, you know, uh, 
ways of coming together that were absolutely supported by the EU. And whilst many people can be critical about the EU and I can be critical about the EU, I can tell you that the people who worked in education and skills, the people who were involved in youth policy and in culture really kind of coalesced and came together and, you know, could and had this passion for that was at the heart of it, it was about people and and um, that social agenda. So we are not part of that anymore. And even if we are invited to conferences and, and um, high level expert groups or whatever, we'll never be in uh, positions of chair or responsibility. And we can't demand things, we can only wait to be invited. There's also a huge issue about a loss um, of recognition of um, qualifications. So that mutual rec recognition of qualifications cross border. And what the hell is the government thinking? You know, the BTEC um, experience I talked about right at the beginning was able to be recognized and rolled out you know, working together with partners from different countries. And now the government want to bring in something else and new, which is tried and untested, which the EU would have to like, will they recognize it? Probably not. You know, we're not, we're not seen as the best partner in terms of um, keeping our word on things. And, um, and, me, and while we've left, all sorts of initiatives have continued to go forwards. And one of them is the common education area, because education was always a member state competency. And yet we did recognise that there were many things that could be better shared um, if people came together. And certainly universities understood that. And people working in early years understood that, for example, and people working in youth provision understood that, and people working in lifelong learning understood that. And there is a journey that is happening now at EU level, which is about this common education area. And unfortunately, we are out of the picture. Um, and then, so maybe just one thing. So I have a I have a qualification to teach a BTEC. So going forwards, does this mean that my qualification won't count? And what about all the kids that I worked with who were motivated through their engagement with the programmes that I ran and the programmes that Headway Theatre ran to then take up um, study at, at BTEC level and get a BTEC and have got those qualifications and have put them on their CV and are very proud of them. And they're now being told that their qualifications are not valued, that they're not important. I think there's a, there's a, there's a huge issue here about valuing people. And if you follow um, the dialogue that's happening around this, these qualifications being described as low level and unimportant and insignificant and confusing, all these negative words certainly are going to make you as a young person who tried really hard and maybe worked in very challenging circumstances to get these qualifications. So that would be young people with disabilities, young carers, people from uh, the BME community, young Roma people. I did loads of stuff on Roma education when I was an MEP. And I just feel that these people are going to really feel like it's a big kick in the teeth. They worked hard to get a BTEC and I worked hard to get my quali qualification to teach it. And now suddenly we are all being told that it's worthless. So that is a massive, ma massive issue. And yeah, I didn't answer your question very much about what the hell can we do about it. Um, I am, I am a pro-European. I think that our place is to be at the heart of Europe with our feet under the table, helping to make the decisions, helping to shape the future for all young people. Um, crises uh, don't stop at borders. Climate change doesn't stop at borders. You know, we've got massive, massive issues around migration. Uh, and all sorts of other things. And I would like to see us at some point, you know, um, be able uh, to return to the place where we need to be. And, uh, and I think that 
the government's kind of, it is completely ideological. So, you know, coming up with the Turing scheme, and it just makes me shiver every time I hear about it. And that is partly because I feel it is an abuse of Alan Turing's name to use this scheme and bring his name into it. It, it really isn't a replacement for Erasmus Plus. It is, um, it won't give the same kind of support. Um, it's not two way. Um, uh, universities don't seem to be um, that enthusiastic about it. And it certainly doesn't tick the plus box on the Erasmus Plus. So um, finding ways to continue to work with people across borders is gonna be really, really, really important. Um, and I do think that arts and creativity is a way to do that. And you don't necessarily have to get big grants from Creative Europe to continue to do that. Um, I think we just have to find ways to maintain our relationships as, as much as we can, but we also have to join campaigns. So I will share the information about the Alliance for Erasmus Plus. Um, uh, and we could do with your support actually for, for the support of everybody, but really getting young people to understand what they have lost is probably the most important thing that we have to do. Um, and to give them, um, a, 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 and to bolster their sense of um, anger about what has happened to them, because it truly isn't fair, the kind of triple whammies that they've been experiencing. Oh, thank you, Julie. Your passion for the arts and young people really comes across. And I personally have benefited from the Erasmus programme and experienced the most incredible training and learning opportunities that are not available through ordinary CPD. But I would now like to invite questions. So we've had three very different and very interesting speakers this afternoon. So any questions in the room, please? Paul, is that you trying to unmute? Um, yeah. there's just there's just so much to take in from all this there's, there's so much to do it's really difficult to come up with um with one specific question um but like you know i, I suppose for us at the moment it's not looking particularly likely that there's going to be a change of government so like what what is what is going to happen how can we work within the existing frameworks to change what is going on i think that's the important thing and that would be for for all three of you like how can we change the narrative on this um i often think like um you, you look at what ukip did to completely change um what was tech, probably a fringe issue in um membership of the european union into the major the the major thing about of, of a generation you know the major political moment in a generation and um i wonder how we can make education as a whole not necessarily just based upon what you've you've said there but how can we make education as a whole that really important issue of a generation or issue of our lifetimes because i think we all agree with them massive like massively that education is hugely important and it needs to change this archaic way that we do with this 1950s education that Michael Gove brought in really isn't suitable for the, a lot of students. And yeah, it's like how to change that conversation so that when, when like the next time an election comes around, then you can campaign on those things that the public are already interested in and already motivated by and say actually i already know about that because i think a lot of the time we come out with a policy and people just don't understand it because you know they haven't heard of it before and i think the, these campaigns are outside of mainstream politics are, are absolutely huge so how can we go about that darren i can see you've got your hand up to answer it that that's a really good question paul and i think it, um, it it's a very long answer but i just think that part of what you're talking about is absolutely right we've got the government we've got 
and we're going to have it for some time to come and who knows what will happen but I think we can't get lost in councils of despair so I go back to what Liz was talking about in terms of the agency that people within the system have currently and notwithstanding the barriers that this government creates looking to see what you can do and what you can achieve for the good even within the constraints that you face the legal constraints the financial constraints some of the things that Liz was talking about in terms of um in terms of the activity at her college I think are a really good example of that also what Julie was talking about as well that kind of action on the kind of social level the fact that communities and individuals can come together and they can make a difference so absolutely things like Erasmus the, the, the kind of withdrawal from that has a profoundly negative impact, but there are still things that individuals, communities can do to make a positive difference to the lives of children and young people. And I think while we are struggling with the government that we've got and the pernicious agenda that it's got, there are still things that people can and are doing in their communities, in their schools, in their colleges. You will know, Paul, as a teacher, that you are making a profound difference to the lives of the young people that you work with. That's what's powerful, that's what matters, and that's what we've got to try and draw attention, attention to. Thank you. Liz? Liz, did you want to come in on that? Sorry, I'm so sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. And I would absolutely endorse what Darren's just said about the power of agency. Um, I think FE uh, has been battered for so long that it's almost lost the will to stand up and fight kind of we're, we're, we're the battered one we're the one that it's done to we are the ones that can't afford it I think that probably because of Covid uh, we are in a really strong position to stand up and say we are the agency for the future to be put right and we have survived we are the sector that has been utterly resilient we've kept our college doors open we've kept our vulnerable students as secure as we could uh, we have done a whole load of things that would never have been achieved i mean if if someone had said to me in february 2019 we would like you, please, to convert uh, all your models of delivery to remote distance learning. We would like all of your staff to be home based and to all engage through teams. Uh, could you please put together a project plan, a plan, a, a pricing and a timeline for that? And I would have put my hands in despair, come up with many millions of pounds, many years of work, many blockers that would mean it would never actually be achieved to time scale and within budget. And it would have gone away again. We did it in two weeks. We did it because actually, if you have to, you get on and do it. And I think that we've got a moment here to say, not, you know, we can't do it, we can't afford it, but actually we're gonna seize this moment. The world has changed. We've got a lot of people who engage with colleges in different ways. And we can see that there are a lot of things that have to now be done differently and quickly. We've got the green economy, we've got the digital transformation, we've got the energy, uh, crisis we've got the environmental crisis colleges the skills agenda have a moment in time to just stand up and say we can do this and i i think that we should be and part of the funding reforms if they happen that give us the autonomy to spend less time wasting our, our staff resource and energy on administrative work and more time on investing funding that comes our way into doing in innovative impactful important things then i think we could really um seize the moment but we have to be loud and proud we have to keep telling the story of the difference that colleges are making and we have to seek out publicity in just the way that vice chancellors have done for many years to say this is what the college sector is doing this is what further education is doing this is what fe and he working together is doing this is what we are doing with employers that's making a difference but actually be brave enough to hold that ground and I'll just give you very briefly a very, very quick example. It's Colleges Week coming up in October. And, you know, it, it's not really part of our expectation, but we are going to uh, launch um, a refugee support project in Colleges Week. And we're going to call it Our Community is Your Community. Because actually some of the most, you think, you think about the news, you think about what's happening in Afghanistan. And we 
welcome our, our, our refugee communities into our, our local neighbourhoods and we give them ESOL. But what do we actually do to enrich their lives, to make them feel not just that we've saved a life, but actually we can enhance their lives by them being part of a UK community? And the answer, in my view, is bugger all. We just do not do it. We give the very bare minimum. We provide the minimum housing, the minimum funding and a bit of ESOL. Oh, hurrah, aren't they lucky? So as colleges, at NCG colleges, we are going to start a project which is about making our community your community and using the college network to enrich the lives of the refugees that come in and do ESOL. So giving them business mentors, helping them write their CVs, putting on sewing, cooking, dancing classes or sessions to just bring a little bit of fun because that's what colleges can do because we have the infrastructure because we have the mindset and because if we want to make a difference little differences have a ripple effect to make big differences so that's just a really really small example of how if you just stand up and say it doesn't really matter that we're not funded for it or it's not on the agenda of our priorities in the strategic plan we can do it Let's just do it and let's tell the story and let's create some waves of publicity. Could I add Yeah, am I able Julie. to add my comments? Yeah. Sorry, I'm on a panel with some amazing speakers, I have to say, and I have not worked in the sector properly, I mean, in detail. Um, uh, it's going to be International Education Week in November. So Liz, you reminded me talking about Colleges Week coming up. There's also an International Education Week as well. My current job actually is that I'm arts lead for the Commonwealth Games International Education Programme across the West Midlands. Um, so we are doing a lot of things to think about these broader connections between um, uh, children and young people in this country and how they relate to you know other young people around the world and interestingly enough the Commonwealth includes some EU countries it includes Malta and Cyprus not many people know that um, so I think that we might be able to continue to work with some EU partners by working through the Commonwealth um, so uh, Let's, yeah, let's take every opportunity with everything that comes up. So International Education Week will be coming up. There'll be International uh, Day of Disability coming up. There's International Human Rights Day coming up. You know, we all do lots of things for International Women's Day. And in fact, International Women's Day has now become a whole month, hasn't it? It's like the whole month of March is International Women's Day. Um, I, over, over the last winter, I worked for City of Sanctuary, which is the UK Welcome Refugee Network. So Liz, it's really fantastic to hear um, that Newcastle um, Colleges Group are going to do this work with um, refugees. And, and I don't know if you've realized that you can become a College of Sanctuary. Maybe you are already one, um, but we should be encouraging all our colleges and universities and schools to, be, to get the, the accreditation, the recognition from City of Sanctuary um, for, their, uh, for this welcome status, because that's really putting two fingers up to the government. And it's wonderful to do that from the perspective of City of Sanctuary, which of course is a charity and is not political um, and allows people to do exactly what the government don't want them to do and to welcome refugees and to integrate them and to value the skills that they bring to their community. Um, I did lots of work with refugees and I was profoundly affected um, to discover that many of the people on the move are professional people who um, did amazing jobs in their own country, including being teachers, business leaders, engineers, inventors, um, you know, chemists, um, architects, all sorts of things. Why, as a country, are we not harnessing the incredible skills that the refugees themselves have brought to this country? We really need to do something about that. And if our, if this sector, if this education sector could really maybe um, spearhead a campaign about that, it would be, it would be wonderful. Um, I think that um, we need to uh, 
we need to have political education and we probably need to slip it in under the radar um, and call it citizenship. I used to think that citizenship, which I was responsible for at EU level, I used to think that citizenship was um, basically getting very angry about stuff and um, going out and having a campaign and maybe being on a march or a protest. I don't think that's the government's um, uh, definition of citizenship, but citizenship is about um, understanding your rights and responsibilities and that sense of agency to make change. And that has to start with, you know, um, an alertness to the things that are wrong in society and how we can change them. So we definitely need to have more political education. Trade unions are, are really key to that. But we need to have citizenship education that isn't just about Britishness, which, you know, is really, that's very concerning. This I, I would fail the Britishness test, by the way. You know, I've seen some of the questions and I don't know the answers. And, it, you know, it's very worrying worrying isn't it that the government thinks that everybody who's coming to this country has to know these you know has to know this stuff um i think we need um we need to yeah that excitement about education and that fun again so and i think the pandemic has taught us the importance of education outdoors you know being outside the classroom um more and more opportunities to be in nature but to be outside the classroom to be in different spaces um and to see learning as not being classroom based um and i would really like um the sector to uh engage more with social enterprises i mean the, the government's idea of employers is, you know, consultation with employers is all the big companies like BAE, you know, they're because, and that's partly because the government are throwing masses and masses of money at militarization and armaments and, you know, nuclear weapons. So, of course, they want to um, consult with BAE systems, but they should be consulting with all employers. And because I did set up a very successful social enterprise which is you know a successful business um i would just like to see us champion more that those alternative um models of business i think that would be very very helpful as well um a couple more things um student clubs can we encourage more student clubs i don't know how uh, how healthy the student voices, student unions, student councils in schools, but they could probably do with a big revitalization. You know, can we offer speakers? You know, can we give opportunities for those um, groups of bodies, those student bodies to come together and do things would be really interesting because those people on those bodies are already people who are not afraid to, um, to make us, you know, to make a stand, to speak out, to, you know, spend time doing this. Um, and I think that we've got a massive issue about well-being and we everything we, that we should be talking about, we should be talking about well-being. The government says well-being, but it doesn't understand it. It doesn't understand that you don't feel well if, you, if you're feeling climate anxiety. You don't feel well if you've had opportunities taken away from you. You know, you don't feel well if you're uh, feeling anxious about whether or not you can afford to move out of your parents' house and, uh, and, and get a place of your own. So let we, let's expand that, um, you know, the things that contribute to well-being. It's not just about um, a medical, uh, a medical diagnosis, you know, um, uh, and a little bit of um, social prescribing, in my view. It's about some much broader, more systematic, fundamental things. Oh, thank you, Julie. Paul, that question sparked quite a response. And thanks for mentioning schools for sanctuary and colleges of sanctuary. We had a talk on that back in May, I think it was, and I contacted Liz and the NTG executive about it and the, about the potential of us maybe joining that in the future. So any other questions, please? Joanna. Unmute. 
Hello. Um, apologies for not being muted earlier on, <laughs> and I didn't spot forever that <laughs> that was a problem. Um, uh, not so much. Well, yeah, I suppose a bit of a question. But first of all, thank you very much, all three of you, uh, for what was really a very interesting um, a set of uh, talks uh, and bringing me up, up to date with where things are. So I suppose I have three questions. One, one would be to Liz, which would be how, how, would, how can you advise us as to what kind of action can we take in relation to further education and the white paper? Because, um, as yeah, I have not gone into the detail of that. Um, and I'm conscious, well, I feel as if SEA is rather higher education focused in its uh, discussions at the moment uh, about um, post-16 education. And uh, so I'd be very interested in your take on what sort of actions we could take as a, as a Northern group um, to um, push that debate a bit further in favor of further education. Uh, I, Secondly, I would like to welcome very much uh, the re timely reminder about Tomlinson uh, and um, uh, Darren, you're, you're reminding us all of what, how far we had got uh, in thinking about uh, a, a new integrated 14 to 19 approach and how it then uh, ground to a halt, never got anywhere. I, I'm the skeptical side of me. <laughs> has to say, if we had won that election, would it have happened? Uh, but um, never mind. Uh, the point is, uh, the work was done and it was so useful. And I think the question is, well, how can we take that further forward? Because it has not featured for years now in any sort of ed education debate we've had. People have just jumped sideways or right over it and completely ignored it. Um, and uh, finally, um, uh, also really interested to hear, Julie, about the fact that as Erasmus, we, we're, although we're no longer members of the EU, um, we've got, um, uh, we can still participate. Uh, so the question is how, uh, you know, what can we do? <laughs> and, and let's get pressurizing that if we can. Um, because uh, it clearly was of great value uh, to all sorts of people at all sorts of levels uh, when it was working, uh, as you outlined. And I know some of the work you've done, you know, with uh, disabled, disadvantaged uh, students in the communities and, and related to theatre. I mean, it's just so exciting and so opening up for all those people. It would be great to be able to carry on doing that, but we need to know how. Thank you, Joanna. Liz, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, I will do. Thank you. Um, so obviously, I think it's about lobbying. Um, if mm -hmm. I was asking you to focus on two specific areas, I think it would be highlighting the disadvantages that will be created by the loss of BTECs and the introduction of T-levels and how they are simply not swapsies. It's just not a viable option. Um, I think the way you could do it really meaningfully is to create a bank of case studies, which I believe you will know far, far better than I, of mm. people who have gone through one route who would simply not have been able to go through the T-level route and make it really meaningful because it's about people. It's not about the politics or the rhetoric or the principles. It's about this person or this group of people would not have been able to do the great things that they have done if the only route available to them was this exclusive route of, of T-levels. I think the second thing that you can do, which would be incredibly helpful, is to bridge that gap, because I, I, I hope I've got it right, that you will have members from both FE and HE, and bridging that gap to make FE and HE really good strong partners, particularly with the um, levels four and five delivery, so that instead of wasting our time and energy on being competitive, we actually work together to be collaborative and to make 
uh, that that offer, that higher technical qualification offer, vibrant, stimulating, great alternative to a degree, really careers based education. And I think you would have a really good role to play in terms of bridging that gap in just the same way that Anya's just reminded me that she talked to, talked to us about colleges of sanctuary ages ago, you know, raise the issues, make it meaningful. Um, and I think really that the, the other bit of that is linking uh, your membership within schools so that the expectations coming out of schools to school leavers is, is really aligned to the offer that's available in both FE and HE. And so I think, you know, the publicity that you could generate, the campaigning that you could do around the disadvantage that would be created if the BTEC is removed and the advantage that would be created by, create, uh, by a bridge between HE and FE that goes really clearly out of the schools, I think are two sort of practical things that I can think of. I don't know if that's helpful. Mm, no, it is. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Great. Any more contributions then or comments or questions for our panel? Um, I probably just need to be um, clear with Joanna that we are not going to be part of Erasmus Plus. The government is removing it completely. So we won't even be able to be partners. I mean, we, we certainly couldn't, couldn't lead on a programme, but we're not going to be able to participate. Turing is their replacement and it isn't a like-for-like -like replacement unfortunately. What I was, I suppose what I was, what I was wanted to talk about is the fact that there is a campaign. There is a group of very angry people who comprise of people from different parts of the Erasmus family. So language teachers, for example, people working in universities, people who have been more involved in the in the in the um, plus bit which I was the kind of youth sector um, there is an alliance that has come together to try and campaign um, to to get back into the Erasmus program out of all the things that the government has done with Brexit um, this is you know, because they, they said in January earlier this year that we were going to stay in Erasmus. So it's on record. They said it. It's in Hansard and then have gone back on their word and actually damaging young people's futures and limiting their opportunities um, is not something that's going to win them many votes um, from from young people anyway. Um, so that basically what we have to do is have the campaign and then where people have already made relationships with institutions and organizations and groups um, and educators in other parts of Europe because of the Erasmus program, I suggest that you maintain those relationships, uh, maintain them regardless of what is happening. I know that Alison at Headway Arts will always have the relationships that she's got with with the institutions who also use arts with people with learning disabilities all across Europe. Those are going to be really long-standing relationships and Jack Drum Arts is going to continue its relationships with young people in Lithuania for example which was its most recent Erasmus Plus program. So hang on to those. But Scotland and Wales are going to campaign very, very hard for Erasmus Plus on a different kind of level. And they are part of our campaign and they might win it first. And young people in Northern Ireland have not lost it at all because they are allowed to participate in the Erasmus Plus programme because of the generosity of the Irish Republic. So maybe through some kind of weird backdoor kind of convoluted routes, we might still be able to be part of it. Maybe we all need in some way or other to get um, affiliated to the University of Dublin, for example, for the, to, the univer to Queen's University in Belfast, for example. Do you know, I mean, I'm just trying to think there might be some creative kind of canny ways of making sure of of trying to undermine what the government's doing in order to get us back to where we where, where we should be. Because it definitely, yeah, it's a horrendous thing to have done to young people, to have taken this away from them. 
And and yeah, I will send the links because I don't have them handy, but I can email them and you can send them to the members, can't you? Yeah. That would be great, Julie. Thank okay. you. All right.